but you'll have to undergo a little bit of experimentation to figure out which carrier oil and which testosterone ester or ester contained within suits your enzyme production best. Welcome to Vigorous PEDs. I'm Coach Steve. Which testosterone ester is best? Now this video will apply to any other anabolic androgenic steroid. And let me give you guys a spoiler alert. Enanthate is best. Actually, it's not true. It highly depends on your body and uh, the amount of esterases, lipases, and hydrolysate enzymes you have present, which you can change as long as you stick with the same ester for a prolonged period of time, because your body adapts to whatever exogenous pharmaceutical compound you inject into it. So let's go over all of it. We'll probably touch uh, suspensions as well, which of course don't have an ester attachment, resulting in the lowest amount of lipophility you could possibly get from an exogenous compound. And that's why they're in a water-based injection, not in oil-based, if you can suspend testosterone suspension, windsorol suspension, or trimbolone suspension in oil-based. It's not oil, it's a solvent. And you're injecting 100% solvent or you know 90% solvent with 10% active pharmaceutical ingredient, um, resulting in a trans tremendous amount of systemic inflammation. So please stay clear for the guys that always repetitively ask in the comment section, oil bases, stay clear, unless it's in MCT and they do some magic. Um, and then even then I would stay clear. Um, so let's go over the esters. Ester attachments make anabolic androgenic steroids more lipophilic, allowing them to be dissolved in lipids or oils. And that's why all the injectable steroids or the majority of them with an ester attachment are in an oil base because the ester makes the anabolic steroids more lipophilic. Now, they might still use a solvent like a benzobenzoate or a sterility compound like benzoyl alcohol to improve the suspension and allow them to su sustain within uh, through uh, temperature changes. So, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry uses a significant amount of benzobenzoate, especially at higher concentrations. And it's just part of the, of the package, basically. So, what happens when testosterone is combined with an ester? Well, ester come, esters comes in many different shapes and sizes. So you'll have esters with a low amount of carbon atoms and esters with progressively increasing carbon atoms. And the more carbon atoms an ester contains, the longer the half-life and the duration of action is going to be. Because carbon atoms are cleaved off by esterases and hydrolysate enzymes, one carbon atom at a time. So when you look at the enanthate or cypionate esters, for example, which both contain eight carbon atoms, you'll see that the half-life of enanthate and cypionate is about two to three times longer compared to propionate, which contains only three carbon atoms. Now the half-life is also determined by how these carbon atoms are positioned. So you'll see that cypionate has a half-life of 12 days, while testosterone enanthate has a half-life of 10 and a half to 12 days. So the mean is a little bit lower even though the amount of carbon atoms are the same. So it has to do with the positioning and how the esterases and hydrolysate enzymes are able to cleave off these uh, carbons, you know, one step at a time. And propionate has a half-life of two to four and a half days. So you see that the mean half-life of propionate is about three times lower than the mean half-life of enanthate and cypionate because the amount of carbon atoms are three times lower. Now, it still highly depends on which esterases you have in your body because it's the esterases and the hydrolysate enzymes which determine at which rate these esters are going to be cleaved off from the testosterone or the other anabolic androgenic steroid that you injected. Now, keep in mind that the carrier oil also highly contributes to the half-life of the ester because the carrier oil needs to be broken down by lipases first before the esterases can get to the ingredients, in this case being testosterone enthate or testosterone propionate, for example. And it's the esterases and the hydrolyzide enzymes that turn the testosterone enanthate into an active pharmaceutical ingredient, being testosterone. So ideally, we want this at a sustained rate, allowing for the most stable serum concentrations, preventing aromatization into estrogen or 5-alpha reduction into dehydrotestosterone, which of course 
you know, you don't want either of those too high because they're, they might get some negative side effects in return. So when you're selecting your ester, you have to keep into consideration your genetic profile and which esterases or hydrolyzed enzymes you have in your body, which favor a particular ester. So maybe your body does better with enantate, or maybe it does better with propionate or cypionate or valerate or, you know, phenylpropionate, etc. You'll have to figure out which of the esters cleaves off at the most sustained rate. So you don't have to increase your injection frequency because again, injection frequency and the rate at which these esters are cleaved off determine serum concentrations. So for sake of convenience, you want the esterases to do the work and not your injection frequency. Now, you know, most people are not going to be that, um, not going to be that in tune with their body where they understand that the injection frequency based on the ester is going to determine what kind of results they're going to get. So let's say we'll go with everyday injections. It might mean that you'll get more stable serum concentrations with testosterone enantate compared to testosterone propionate because your esterases are favoring the enantate ester. But it could be that they favor the propionate ester and cleave them off at a much sustained rate, allowing for better serum concentrations on testosterone propionate, even when you're doing daily administrations of, you know, different kinds of esters. So you have to take that into consideration when you're designing your protocol. You have to, you know, experiment a little bit with different testosterone esters before you figure out which ester suits you best. And then you have to keep into consideration that the carrier oil highly contributes because lipases need to break down carrier oils. And of course, there's many different kinds of carrier oils. You have castor oil, grapeseed oil, cottonseed oil, sesame oil, arachis oil, which I'm not really a big fan of because of inflammation in, in a lot of people that it can cause, and MCT oil or co refined coconut oil, which absorbs very readily and disperses very readily because lipases are very familiar with medium chain triglycerides because they're almost bioidentical. They're, you produce medium chain triglycerides and short chain and long chain just by yourself. And lipases are very familiar with medium chain triglycerides. So you'll see that the absorption and the dispersion of MCT is considerably more rapid compared to castor oil, which takes a significant amount of time before lipases really dissolve and metabolize the oil away allowing for the pharmaceutical ingredient to be subject to esterases and dehydrolysate enzymes, allowing for the pharmaceutical ingredient to become active and raise serum concentrations. So all these things you have to think about when you choose a particular product. So my favorite, for example, is Bayer or Rotex Medica testosterone enantate in castor oil because my body responds very well to castor oil. And it responds very well to the enanthate ester. So I've always stuck with enanthate, whether that's testosterone enanthate, methanolone enanthate, drostenolone enanthate, and even trimbolone enanthate, even though that was not really a good experience, uh, probably because of the trimbolone, not the enanthate itself. But I found that for myself, the testosterone enanthate or the enanthate ester in a carrier oil that has a, you know, very high viscosity lighting, even though it has a significant amount of benzo benzoate, to increase the solvency and uh, allow it, the testosterone enantate to stay in suspension at different temperatures because pharmaceutical products are sold in many different countries with different climates and different temperature ranges, but they're not going to design, you know, pharmaceutical products specific for different temperatures. They're going to cover all the temperature ranges which usually results in a much higher benzyl benzoate concentration, allowing testosterone enantate to be stable at you know, low temperatures and high temperatures. That's why you have a range on the package. Please store between 10 to 20 degrees, for example, which is, you know, a significant temperature range. But some of the underground labs that don't use benzyl benzoate or, you know, 5 to 10 percent, you'll see that some of their, you know, their products crashes at a lower temperature. So this is why the benzyl benzoate concentration of pharmaceutical grade products is usually a little bit higher because of the temperature ranges that it's being sold in. Now, I feel that castor oil matches the testosterone enantate ester or enantate ester in general uh, the most favorably. So 
esters with a half-life over 10 days, so let's say 10 to 12 days, 15 days, maybe even 18 days, like testosterone decunate, those are usually suspended in castor oil because it sustains the half-life and allows for stable serum concentrations. Now, when you look at it logically, testosterone propionate with a much shorter half-life or phenyl propionate or acetate, ideally those are suspended in a much more viscous carrier oil because you want it to be absorbed a little bit faster because the injection frequency, needless to say, is going to be spaced closer together. So an ester with a shorter half-life allows to be suspended in a carrier oil with a lower or a higher viscosity rating, allowing it to be absorbed a little bit more readily. So testosterone propionate or phenyl propionate or acetate would probably be suitable in safflower oil, sunflower oil, grapeseed oil, arachis oil, which all have comparable viscosity ratings. Now what happens when you put anatate, cipionate, decunate, undecunate, you know, any ester with a considerably long half-life into a carrier oil with that's very easily absorbed, like MCT, for example, which is, you know, very subject to lipases and disperses very easily, is that the half-life of these esters is significantly reduced. Now, when you look at the formulations of these kinds of products, you see that esters with a considerably longer half-life are usually produced in a much higher concentration because esters with more carbon atoms increase its lipophilicity tremendously over esters with a shorter half-life because they have less carbon atoms. So the more amount of carbon atoms that they contain, the higher the concentration is going to be in a pharmaceutical grade product. So you see that testosterone anethate or cipionate are usually between 200 to 250 milligrams per milliliter. Testosterone decunate or nebido is also 250 milligrams per milliliter. But testosterone propionate, most formulations are 50 to 100 milligrams per milliliter because the ester doesn't have so many carbon atoms, allowing it to be moderately lipophilic, but not as lipophilic as anthocyanate or decunate. So keep that in mind. Don't go with a product that has 300 milligrams of testosterone propionate, because testprop is not that lipophilic by itself, which means that the carrier oil is either tremendously or a tremendous solvent, or they combine MCT, which, you know, is a significant solvent by itself, with ethyl oleate or propylene glycol or benzoyl alcohol at, at reasonably high concentrations to increase the solvency further. So now you don't really have a carrier oil, you have a solvent. And again, this lipophilic properties of anthate, propionate, cipionate, etc., it doesn't really matter if you're using a tremendous amount of solvent. But solvents do increase systemic inflammation, depending on the solvent used. Benzobenzoate doesn't really increase systemic inflammation, but some of the other ones do. So please keep that in mind. There's a maximum concentration that each ester is able to facilitate, given that it's suspended in a organic carrier oil, like cottonseed oil, grapeseed oil, sunflower oil, castor oil, etc., so don't go with these uh, high concentration products, please, because it's mostly solvent and that's just going to lead to a tremendous amount of inflammation. So you'll have to figure out which ester and which carrier oil your body agrees with. Ideally, you stick with a pharmaceutical grade product. So whether that's a testosterone anethate or decunate in castor oil or testosterone cipionate in cottonseed oil or uh, sustenone in arachis oil. For example, there's many different carrier oils and the active pharmaceutical ingredient which are contained within. But you'll have to undergo a little bit of experimentation to figure out which carrier oil and which testosterone ester or ester contained within suits your enzyme production best. Because esterases and hydrolysate enzymes and lipases are a group of enzymes and the ratio between each esterases or lipases or hydrolysate enzymes varies differently from person to person. So you have to undergo a little bit of experimentation. I found that castor oil and testosterone anethate works very well for me, but some of my clients just get post-injection pain with the exact same product that I'm using, and their serum concentrations are not that favorable. And then they switch to a product which is testosterone propionate in cottonseed oil, and it's smooth like butter. Really. So... The ester and the carrier oil, the only way you really figure out which one works best for you and gives you the best serum concentrations is through experimentation. 
And that's how you figure it out. And then you all you have to manage is really your injection frequency to allow for favorable estradiol concentrations of, of course, compounds that are, um, you know, converting into estradiol. Because primobolin, you know, when you look at the serum concentrations of primobolin enantate, they stay relatively stable with two administrations per week. When you don't have to worry about uh, estradiol conversion because primobolin doesn't convert into estradiol. So I feel that for my body and some of my clients' bodies, testosterone enantate and castor oil is best. That's why I always mention that in this, all these videos. But for some of the clients that I have, testosterone propionate in cottonseed oil is better or testosterone cypionate in grapeseed oil is better. And the only real way you can figure that out is through experimentation. So a blanket statement like testosterone enantate is the best, absolute best. Everybody should use testosterone enantate. Unfortunately, it's not true. There's no black and white answer to this scenario. You're going to get have to get your hands dirty and figure it out for yourself. And I really hope that helps. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find those ebooks on my website, vigorousteve.com slash shop. You can find the rates to my services for personalized advice there as well in the services section. Contact me through the contact form if you're interested in one of those services. If you're not following me on Instagram, that would be highly appreciated. At Vigor Steve, I'm trying to get my followers there as high as my subscribers here on Instagram. So I'm about 4,000 followers short. So please go to Instagram and follow me there for day-to-day -day activities on my life. Much appreciated. Vigorous crew. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys in the next video.